today it is my a pleasure to interview Dr. Lai Qinglong, a world leading um, hepatologist and the fifth most cited doctor of internal medicine on Google Scholar. He has done groundbreaking research in clinical trials of lamivudin, telbivudin, and um, 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 entis, and um, anticover, which have contributed greatly to the decline of, of hepatitis B. He was also appointed to a Simon K. Wiley professorship in gastroenterology at the University of Hong Kong. So, Dr. Lai, you're a leading scientist, and uh, obviously, you're one of the one of the world's leading um, hepatologists. You've done crucial clinical research on many hepatitis B drugs, but such a successful career. Can you fill in any more details about your educational background to give a fuller picture? Oh yeah, I, I have actually been starting to study um, gastroenterology in the first place, and then hepatology. That is literally research, something like around five to 10 years, six years after my graduation. And the reason why I chose hepatology is because there are lots of unknown, unknown liver diseases in Hong Kong, in the Chinese in those, in those days, which was in the 1960s and 70s. And it was actually intriguing. We've got so many, so many patients with cirrhosis and liver cancer. And that's why I chose it. And it was, it, as it turns out, it actually most of our liver diseases in Hong Kong and in the Chinese are due to hepatitis B, which was actually first discovered in 1968. And it was by around 1970, that we discovered that around 80 to 90% of our hepatitis and liver patients are suffering from hepatitis B. Okay, and, so, um, yeah. for, for, so uh, once again, we talked about hepatitis B, so for any listeners out there who need to review, what is hep um, hepatitis B and what makes hepatitis B so problematic? Okay, yeah, okay. I'll show you some slides. All, All right. right. Can you see it? This yes. is actually hepatitis B virus under election microscopy. Mm -hmm. And it is actually a hexagonal virus. Here, this is a complete virus and with a surface and a so-called core. And these are excessive, the empty ones are actually excessive surface antigen, which is now used for vaccine for, of the babies, of the newborn babies. And mm. the next slide, actually. Yeah, only very few slides. Just it's one of the tiniest DNA viruses in the whole world. Um, it's a tiny virus, but because it's got so many so-called overlapping frames, it produces a lot of viral particles and viral antigens. And uh, just, just to make it simple, this is a service antigen, which is, as I've mentioned, the thing that I now use to make vaccines. And I, and I think you are going to ask me the next question, is why is it is so common in the Chinese population? Of the roughly 257 million chronic hepatitis B subjects in the world, Unfortunately, three quarters of them are Chinese. The reason is actually very simple. Um, not that simple, okay. Uh, hepatitis B virus is probably a very old virus, several thousand years old, unlike hepatitis C and HIV. HIV is very new, as you probably know. Um, hepatitis B virus therefore infects the ancient races, mostly the Chinese and the Africans. And we transmit it to each other mostly through birth or within the first one or two years of birth, mostly from the mother, but also from the father. Close contact well, during childhood would make the child be a, become a chronic carrier. Whereas actually if you, you contact hepatitis B right now through casual unprotected sex, I'm not saying you, the people, uh, through unprotected sex, adults, uh, through unprotected sex, contact hepatitis B, the chances of them become a chronic care is very low. It's only in childhood, when you, either the moment of birth or within the first two years of birth, that you become a chronic carrier. And this is why the Chinese and the Africans have the majority of the hepatitis B carriers. And Chinese, the China having a larger population, therefore the majority are actually Chinese. And it's not very common in the Caucasian countries. Just, and, and this is the world area incidence of, incidence of children under five years old of 
high incidence of hepatitis C. Here you see the dark blue one, Africa, has very high incidence, and also and also China, and also actually the Australia, also the Aborigines, they also have high incidence. So these are all the ancient ancient races. And just the final slide, and and as you can see, actually, this is recently published in 2018. Because of the hepatitis D vaccine, the younger population has almost no hepatitis D, whereas the older population above the age of 20 are up to 7 to 8 percent of them are actually chronic carriers. So I hope I've made myself understandable. Have I? Yes. Okay, so much for the slides. So, yes. Yeah. Yeah, so I asked some follow-up questions. Um, so you talked about how 75% of these carriers are Chinese people, and also most of them are what we are what you call, you know, the Asian races. So why is hepatitis B so common among Asian races specifically? As I said, probably actually the Beijing, as far as I know, probably the Beijing men already have hepatitis B. Oh. Well, it's, um, the Caucasians do, don't simply don't have it, and we just transmit from one generation to the other through the mother or the father during the first two years of childhood. Mm -hmm. So if these uh, Caucasians, they are lucky, they don't have it. So um, and if they acquire it during adult, adulthood uh, through unsafe sex, most of most of them will manage to clear away the virus because the immune system of the adult is actually help, uh, mature, whereas children they cannot clear the virus and become chronic carriers. All right, so is there a way to minimize the number of, of um, hepatitis B carriers, specifically in Chinese people? Definitely, uh, because as I've mentioned actually twice, there are now vaccines. Uh, since the 1980s, they used the surface of the hepatitis B virus to create the vaccine, uh, which is actually much more um, protective than just, uh, COVID vaccine right now, actually. It seems it's not really a joke, actually. But if, if they just extract the surface of the virus and to, to produce a vaccine, and the babies will develop antibody against the surface of the hepatitis virus, and they will be completely, if they develop the antibody, they'll be 100% protected against hepatitis B infection. And this is why now, this is why the younger population in China, in the last slide I've just shown, a lot of them, the incidence of hepatitis has dropped markedly. And also, the, so the vaccine has to be given in three doses right at the moment of birth. And then one month later, and also six months later. Almost like the COVID vaccines, we both receive the second dose of COVID vaccine in one month. And we are, we are now we don't even know whether we require the third dose of COVID vaccine. For the babies, for hepatitis B, they need a third dose every six months. And if they develop antibody, they will be protected for life. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. So, so regarding the vaccines that you were talking about, uh, what were some key or unexpected challenges when during clinical trials of lamivodin, talbavodin, um, anticat, caver, 1004? Yeah, yeah. yeah yes. sorry, once again, <laughs> these words are a bit long and, and hard to pronounce. 1004, disoprosyl, formerate, and 1004 ala feminine, the feminine. <laughs> it's yeah, it's a bit, it's a bit worry. Uh, I'll admit it. No, 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 it's okay. It's fun. <laughs> Actually, when I when in the 1980s they used interferon to treat the hepatitis B virus, and mm -hmm. it's not very successful. And now, since the nine, early 90s, uh, 1990s, they then started to find this so-called nucleoside analog. They are, they are analogs, analogs to the nucleosides, which can then attack the virus. And not attack, which then mimic uh, the virus and, uh, and then cause the virus to stop replication, uh, which is very successful. And, and you have to, however, you may, you have to take the drug uh, once, one tablet per week, uh, one tablet per day for life, which to me is okay. Actually, if you have hypertension, you take it one or just sometimes two or three tablets a day for life so it doesn't really matter because if you stop the virus to come back and being a dna virus the virus actually is very clever it hides inside your cells it can actually integrate into the host's dna 
and this is how you may cause uh, cancers, etc. But now with this lamivudine, which is the first drug tried, and it was very successful in suppressing virus. The good bad thing is actually the virus became resistant, well, with something like sixteen percent within the first year, and by the fifth year, seventy plus percent will be resistant. This is why we got newer drugs. The, the second most important drug was actually antagonist, which I also um, tried. And this one, the resistance rate is only 1.3%. And then, okay, we'll skip and no, we, uh, um, we, we'll skip therapy because it's now no, not really infection. The two new, the newest drug will be Tenovavir. Tenovavir was actually first used in HIV subjects. And then they use the HIV preparation resistance, Tenovavir disoprosome fumarate to treat hepatitis C and the resistance rate is zero. And, but there's some, there are some side effects if you take for them for too long, they may cause bone, bone degeneration, et cetera. And then therefore they bring in the newest, which is tenovir elephantamide, which is again, gives 0% resistance. So actually currently the two first line agents will be antagonist, 1.2% resistance, and tenovir elephantamide with almost no side effects, zero resistance. But uh, the thing is, you have to take your tablets for life. One tablet a day, but which to me is absolutely perfectly acceptable. What do you think if you have advertising, would you or do you not take one tablet a day? Um, yeah, I would take one, one, one pill per day, I guess. Just yeah, no problem. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's just I think, you know, if you take more than once, let's say two times a day, then it's a bit it's too much pills for me. Yeah, exactly. And yeah, regarding all of these vaccines, I would say, uh, is there going to be any new, new type of medications for um, hepatitis B? Because I know we we're discussing a bacillus but then it apparently got canceled at phase yeah. two trial by Korean by a Korean drug company. So, is there going to be any other new drugs that's going to combat hepatitis B? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so just I mean, the vaccine is for prevention. So the babies that we got it, they will never, they should never be a chronic carrier. The, the drugs are actually for people who are already existing oh, okay. with B carriers. Okay, so, um, one of my colleagues, are, some colleagues are trying new drugs because as I've mentioned, you have to take the drug for, for life and they think it is not really good. Uh, so they are trying to somehow make the patients just have a limited time of taking the drugs, which to me may not be too successful. Because as I've mentioned, the hepatitis B virus is a DNA virus that can integrate uh -huh. the, the host um, genome. So it's probably there. For, even if you manage to so-called more or less create a virus, it will probably be still causing damage. So yes, there's new drugs being tried, but it's trying to eradicate it completely, uh, which to me is not exactly the most promising of um, proposals. But uh -huh. having said that, the, the existing drug antagonist and tenovir elephantamide, they, can, they are proven to decrease liver cancer as well as reverse cirrhosis of the liver. Cirrhosis is hardening of the liver. So it's really actually very good. Um, the disease incidence, the death incidence or due to the hepatitis virus is markedly decreased. Okay. Yes. And once again, you talked about how um, hepatitis B, their, their DNA, like, you know, they have DNA genomes. So uh, you probably heard of Dr. Derek Rossi and his mRNA vaccine. So what do you, do you have anything to say regarding this new technology of mRNA? Yeah, okay. The new drug, the new drugs I'm talking about, the mRNA is the vaccine though. Uh, for the hepatitis, you don't have the mRNA, you just have to just use the coat of the virus. And then it's very safe because it's not even the virus. So you can keep it to to the baby, and there's absolutely no no side effects. Unlike the mRNA, we know that there are side effects. Okay, um, as but the mRNA has been now trying to use to eradicate the virus, the hepatitis virus, um, for those who are carriers, not the not the babies. Okay, and I'm not as I mentioned, it's, I'm not sure it's going to be successful. Mm. So, is hepatitis B ever going to be vanquished from the world? Yes, I have um, something like over 190 countries now vaccinating their babies at birth, uh, which means that most population of the diabetes is actually markedly decreasing. 
So okay, there are still existing carriers, but okay, they will go away eventually. But um, new carriers are topic by the 19, by 2050, I think the new carriers are almost going to be zero around the whole world. So yes, I think we'll be, you know, get into the, of the infection. Uh, I hope the COVID infection is going to die too. I don't know when. So uh, what is the difference between NASH, uh, non-alcoholic, steatohepatitis, and, and NAFLD, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease? Oh, it's NASH, as, yeah. As you know, alcohol can cause fatty liver. So it's mm -hmm. called ash, if you like. But your, your NASH is non-alcoholic uh, liver disease, and it is getting more and more common. It is associated with fatty liver, not due to drinking. Mostly due to so-called metabolic disorders. That is patients who are fat, obese, and tons of it in the Chinese even now. And then mm -hmm. people who actually has diabetes and also has got increasing cholesterol level. And these people are very likely to develop NASH. And it's getting, as far as I know, it's getting more and more common, both abroad and in the Chinese. And I don't know why the Chinese are supposed to be slim. I am okay. But now most of my patients, 50% of my patients are probably have some degree of fatty liver. Yeah. Um, no, because I thought it was interesting because I thought someone told me that alcohol could like, it's like bad for the liver or something. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, as I've mentioned, alcohol can cause alcoholic fatty liver. Oh, so, okay. And, and the alcoholic fatty liver can eventually lead to cirrhosis and liver cancer. Mm -hmm. um, actually, in the Caucasian population, alcoholic liver disease is one of their top, top liver killer, whereas in Asians, it's hepatitis B, all right? So, yes, alcohol definitely, you're eating too much, small amount can protect your heart, but by small amount, I mean for men, one or two glasses of wine, and for women, only one glass of wine per day. Uh, it can protect your, your, your heart, but then large amount can cause alcoholic liver disease with, with, resulting in cirrhosis and liver cancer. Yeah, and regarding cirrhosis, uh, what are some ways to prevent cirrhosis from happening? The, the, um, for hepatitis B, if you um, use the drugs that I've mentioned, mm -hmm. Easy. And alcohol, drink less, then you have no cirrhosis, all right? And NASH, you have to decrease your weight, treat your diabetes, and treat your hypercholesterolemia better. It would actually also be recede. So actually, liver disease um, in the world is actually going to be actually quite promising. And also, obviously, I've not mentioned about hepatitis C. C is not as common as B, but it is most common in people who use drugs. Uh, and C, Hep C is actually rising in the world because people who like to use drugs. You know what I mean? Showing yeah. 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 Um, we, have, we have a lot of people using drugs in America, actually. So, yeah, yeah. there's this, there's a class just teach us, hey, don't, you know, don't, don't take these drugs and that because uh, we're actually near Mexico, so in Mexico, um, for for some re yeah, for some reason they're like a place like they grow like meat and stuff basically, and yes, so that's why the school is trying to teach us, you know, don't don't take don't take drugs and stuff. So yeah, yes, yeah. I do know what you mean because yes, I've yes, been. Yes. Sorry. Yes, yes. They use the drug through syringes in occasion, and they share the syringes, and this is how they got hepatitis C, sharing oh. of syringes. People who use inject drugs, the so called pubic. Oh, yeah, that's. So, not, not just the other drugs, but these special drugs like opium, etc., where heroin, mm -hmm. where you use, to use needles to so inject, and yeah. they all share yeah. these syringes. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you're an important scientist who has contributed a great deal of research on hepatitis B. So, why do you choose to work in a public hospital rather than go to a private hospital? Oh, I, I like the atmosphere. I like teaching. I like to do research. If I go to private hospital, okay, I've earned a lot, lot, lot much more money, but I don't have students to school then okay, okay, to teach. And also, I can't do much research. Uh, I like teaching research and seeing patients. So, university is the best place to do all three. Okay. Yeah, and regarding teaching, um. I know you retired in 2014, but you still want to teach students and do research, which you mentioned 
and uh, HKU renewed your employment contract. So why do you enjoy teaching so much? I don't know, actually, it's probably inborn, actually, as, even as a middle school student, I was teaching, I was giving private tutorials to the younger students. So I've, I've been doing this actually since age 14 or so. Mm-hmm. And you know my age now. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, the Hong Kong government announced that Hong Kong permanent residents with overseas medical training can apply to become a doctor in Hong Kong without taking the exams. Do you think this is a good solution to Hong Kong shortage of medical doctors? Actually, I think I previously we the, the doctors from abroad we have to take a, a so-called licensing exam to get a license. Oh, and okay. the exams are not difficult actually. It is just what my our medical students take. I actually prefer the doctors to be examined first before they just come and practice. Um, mm-hmm. Because some of the, the standards in different areas may be different. So if it's proven that they are good of good standard, of course, I welcome them to come to Hong Kong. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I also noticed you're very interested in photography. So what is it about your personality that made photography one of your main hobbies? I am actually very interested in all, all aspects of art. I like plays. I like Shakespeare. I read the all 37 plays of Shakespeare. Oh. And also like, yeah, I like operas. I like classical music. I, I like sculptures. I like pictures. And if I like pictures, I would like to produce pictures even though I don't draw. So I take pictures. All right. And uh, for Shakespeare, so you've read all of them. So you've read Macbeth. Uh, yeah. yeah. Romeo and Juliet. A lot. Yeah. And uh, have you read Les Miserables? Les what? Oh, yeah. Les- yeah. Yes. Oh, I, I read a lot of novels. So yes. I love the musical. Yeah, yeah. It's, a, yeah, it's a very classical book, but it's really like thick. Like the books, <laughs> yeah, it's really long. It's really no. Yeah. Yeah, I'm like one third of it. It's 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 real long. It's, I think it takes like a week for me. <laughs> yeah, I, I took a long time reading it, but still it's interesting though. Mm-hmm. And if long chapters about um some of the chapters are a little bit too long, but it's okay. Yeah, and uh Actually, I just noticed this. Uh, you also love to wear vivid and colorful suits, as I can see you wearing all yellow, which looks which looks really good. Uh, were you always that way, or was there something that catalyzed this habit in you? Okay, in the Chinese, there's this saying that when a person is not free, they use um, clothes to hide it. Uh, can I, I use the Chinese? I'm telling you, you don't. This is why I, I want to wear good clothes to hide my ugly face. And uh, also, uh, why bow ties? I mean, you have a really shiny bow tie over there. Yeah, because I was wondering, because like, many of my friends don't wear bow ties because I go to a Catholic school and, you know, we have, like, church. Yeah, many of them don't wear bow ties. So I was just wondering why do you prefer to wear bow ties more than, like, regular ties? Uh, because it's special. Also, actually, if you're a doctor, a tie would be long and then it would, may touch the patient. Uh, In Britain, as I they are not even allowed to wear any ties. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, I hope you like the bow tie. <laughs> yeah, it looks really shiny. Looks good. Yeah, and you're also a big Pokemon Go fan. So, how do you get introduced to Pokemon Go, and what yeah. aspect of it do you like? I like it all the time. I'm I actually, I'm still playing. <laughs> oh, yeah, I, yeah. Speaking of Pokemon Go, I still have the app. Like, I played it when it was like really popular, but like once again, I still play it, but not much anymore. And yeah, speaking of Pokemon, like, what's your favorite Pokemon out of probably like every Pokemon you catch? I like all of them. I call them my sons. <laughs> oh, okay. Just, okay, just like students. For example, you, you should theoretically at least like all the students. So I like all of them. And I, actually, it's getting it's still getting quite popular. Nowadays, they have remote um, rates, so you can actually don't have to go yeah. out. Oh, and yeah, so- yeah. And uh, I think we talked about this, but most people don't realize that medical doctors actually get really little training in health and nutrition, but you're obviously a really healthy guy. So what advice can you give on how to maintain a healthy lifestyle? Oh, I don't know. Actually, I eat a lot, actually. I, I'm just very lucky. But okay, if you, are, you, you tend to be fat, eat a little bit less. Uh, Expense the carbohydrates and also fruit, the fructose from fruit is also quite bad for fertility. 
So eat less, which I know is easier said than done. <laughs> but you, you are okay right now. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, one and and also like no ice cream, no sweets, yeah, or less sweets, or, or less sweets. You no, know, no, 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 not no exactly. But okay. some some lucky guy like me, I can eat a lot, which is but for those who tend to eat fat, just reduce the diet. Yeah. Um. What is one area of hepatology that's going to become a big trend? Nash, obviously, because yeah. everybody is now actually. As I said, a lot of them, I'm sure you, you know a lot of big guys in you know, in America. This oh is yeah, the, that's true. Yes, the the uh, especially the football players. I don't know if you watch American football. Yeah, most of them are 220 pounds. Yeah, and yeah it, it's yeah. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna be honest. In high school, they they play play football. They're like that big. Like if you go to school, like they're that big, and it's and it's a bit terrifying, but uh. <laughs> yeah, they're, yeah, you're right. There are people in America that are that big because they have to play football or they do wrestling, basically, sometimes. The good thing about American food is they have really huge dishes, but there's a reason why you get yes. them so fast. And also, people eat a lot of fast food there, so that's the reason why, you yeah. know, people are, are real big. Yeah, uh, I also noticed, like, you also like going on vacations. I mean, I also love going to vacations. If, if you could take a two week vacation anywhere in the world right now, where would you go? Oh, everywhere actually. My favorite places are um, Europe, of course, and for example, Italy and also uh, England, but then also America. I love, I love San Francisco and also California and, um, and New York. And also, have you been to Iceland? It's beautiful. No, but I know it's really small. I know someone that has relatives in Iceland and they say they hate it there apparently just to the fact of the weather is cold. So I know someone who has relatives in Iceland. It's just they they told me that they it, like their experience wasn't as good as what I thought it was. Go there during summer. I went there only once um, so far since August. Actually, it's actually, uh, uh, actually really nice. For example, in Australia, New Zealand, they're also New Zealand is really beautiful too. I went there in I go there in, in uh, my autumn, my winter, and in this fair summer, and the weather is always very nice too. All right. So, uh, what advice did you receive during your career that shaped your success? I think actually do try to do what we think I, I interest you. Okay, and spend spend as much time as you want in the thing that interests you, but. Obviously, you still have spare time like me. I still like to read books, like to still attend concerts, etc., and mm -hmm. play Pokemon, <laughs> even now. Yeah, so what advice would you give to students who want to pursue biology or become a doctor? Absolutely. I think, to me, actually, the obviously one of the most interesting thing that you can do is to be a doctor. Actually, there are two um, vocations that I think can really save people. One is being a doctor, okay, also paramedical stuff. Another one is being a fireman. These are the two, two vocations that are really, really helping and saving people. Yeah, Just, and also, yeah, uh, regarding doctors, um, you probably heard of AI, right? Artificial intelligence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, uh, you no, know, people are starting to make AIs that can replace surgeons while they're doing surgery. So do you have, any, do you have anything to say about maybe potential uh, replacement of doctors with computers or robots. I don't think I think I would welcome AI AIs, but I think they cannot replace the human. They, okay, some some uh, operations can be done, but for example, the AI. Uh, if you see a patient, what questions should they ask? How to and then uh, to decide what diagnosis the patient, what investment would you do? I I think you still need this. So okay, we still have has but, to play maybe smaller. Mm -hmm. But there, there's going to be other um, actions like you know during surgery making a precise cut where you probably yeah. think using an AI is much more convenient. Yeah, fortunately I'm not a surgeon. <laughs> uh, um, so uh, is there anything we didn't touch upon that you like to tell our audience? I think actually. Now that is the COVID, I hope all of you have taken the vaccine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you and recommend everyone take two doses, right? Yeah. 
And probably, I now do not know, but probably maybe the third dose. I have already taken the, the first two doses um, within the first time it's available in Hong Kong. Yeah, and, uh, same. And also, as you notice, I actually wear masks, masks when I go, abroad, go outside. But just keep yourself safe. Uh, but at the same time, you can enjoy yourself. Um, you can play, play games and also you can play games with your um, friends without seeing each other, just remote games. I think you can still enjoy your, enjoy your life. And I actually now, I, since I can't go abroad, I go hiking every weekend. Uh -huh. And I'm very actually lucky in Hong Kong, quite a few hiking places. But you in, you in California, you've got plenty of places to go to. Yeah. Yosemite. Uh, Yosemite, Santa Cruz Mountains. Uh, you know, stunning. Yeah. Yeah, this, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a lot in California in that. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> Yeah, you can walk along the beach, the beach coastlines. I, yeah. I think, I think Hong Kong does a beach. Big Sur, yeah, Big Sur is one. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, there's a lot to in California. Yeah, so you, you're actually even more lucky than I am. Actually, I've got a small, tiny island, you've got a huge, just California itself. It's bigger, I don't know how many times bigger than Hong Kong. Yes, that population is much larger, I think, basically, much, much more larger. Um, yeah. I would say more land, so there's more houses. I mean, Hong Kong does have a housing crisis, so, yeah. so yeah, that is that is one good thing. It's yeah. yeah, at least people can afford to have a house or maybe an apartment. So yeah, that's and you can come meet your friends by distance. You still don't have to be too near each other. Yeah, yeah, more way to practice social distancing actually in California. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, uh, I know in Hong Kong it's like kind of pack so yeah i'm trying to think like how you, you can't practice social distancing like you want to go shopping for food like you can't practice social distancing it's like what two meet what two feet apart i don't know we, we can't we all this is why we all wear masks oh okay we, we all wear masks and uh, actually uh vaccination rate is actually pretty low but we all wear masks and my mm -hmm. mask actually also matches our suit yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was pretty nice, <laughs> to be honest. All right, so uh, it is my pleasure to interview Dr. Lai uh, in this episode. So once again, Dr. Lai, thank you for being in this episode. And uh, and to everyone listening, I hope you guys all learned about more about you know, internal medicine and also hepatology and also Dr. Lai's um, expertise. So once again, thank you, Dr. Lai. It is a pleasure talking to you. <laughs> you too. All right. Okay, bye-bye.